Right, guys, today I'm here with Jacob Karras. Jacob has a very interesting and unique business, which I really want to kind of unpack here in this conversation. But maybe before we get into that, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you sort of got to where you are today and, you know, discovered what you do now. Sure, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Of course. Looking forward to, to diving in. Um, yeah, so my I've kind of done a little bit of everything over the last couple of years. But if we go right back, I was in the, the corporate finance game for quite a few years. Um, I'm an accountant by trade which is very different to what I do now with marketing, like other side of the brain. But I did a somewhat interesting form of accounting. We did like turnarounds of big, big businesses. Did a couple of years in New York and restructured bankruptcy um, bound companies and helped some emerge from bankruptcy, like companies doing 500 million a year plus wow. in revenue. And while I was over there, I uh, decided that I kind of wanted to do something a little bit different with my my life when I was coming back to Australia. I'm in that phase where, you know, didn't have kids, didn't have a mortgage. It's like life doesn't get less complicated mm -hmm. um so that was the time to to give it a go the other thing was like doing that over there and then coming back to australia and doing the same things like going from you know playing for australia in cricket to playing backyard cricket like mm -hmm. it's just a different ball game so wanted to take a new path and um started reading some books and uh, i think I, I think i bought a tony robbins book and bought a um, book by Jeff Walker and ended up in the kind of internet marketing circles and fell into affiliate marketing, which uh, is a business model that a lot of businesses use, probably more than most people realize. Uh, and it's a, it's a really cool avenue to kind of get your feet wet in terms of trying to come online because you only really need to worry about, well, can I get eyeballs to a product and then they deal with the rest. And I was so busy with work. Like I was doing 80 hours plus a week. That made sense to me at that point in time. I could get a link and then I was like, right, if I can get some traffic to this thing, maybe I can make it work and like the first thing I sold was like a book and I made like a dollar I was like shit it's that first dollar though man I'm like, telling you it changes works. your paradigm forever yeah I saw it like in the little screenshot thing it was like this orange bar and I was like oh my god it's like mm. internet money you know and then that kind of hooked me in and uh, went down the affiliate rabbit hole pretty deep over the next couple of years that's what allowed me to kind of get out of corporate in 2018 did some big promotions with the guys at ClickFunnels Tony Robbins Dean Graziosi a couple of other companies and did that for a few years over those couple of, it's it's a competitive space it's mm. a very competitive space there's a lot of people that want to do it um, but the success rates are not high because if you think about you've got one product and you've got potentially thousands tens of thousands of people trying to sell the sa the exact same thing um, it's like people think their niche is competitive try sell the same exact same product as like 10,000 mm. other people and so because I did quite well the demand for how I was doing it and what I was doing accumulated relatively quickly. And I had a little Facebook group where I was kind of documenting, I wasn't really selling. I was just documenting what I was doing from like the first 10 grand, you know, onwards. I'd like run home in my lunch break from the office with my suit on and like do a live, wow. kind of talk about what I was doing. That's, that's the grind right there. It, it, that was the grind. And I was getting like three, four hours sleep a night ended kind of messily because I got home one night and my blood pressure was like 180 on 120. I just oh, hadn't shit. been sleeping enough and eating like shit and that's what ultimately got me to quit work wow. and so yeah, i did that for a few years and then uh, the the demand really built up and had a lot of people asking me what i was doing and how i was doing it so i teamed up with a couple of guys and we built a course and coaching program in that space which took off it was a uh, kind of the, the classic like new opportunity for people we we're doing things in quite a different way and uh we the other way most of that the problem with that industry is everyone's like make a million bucks in three seconds. Mm -hmm. And it's just not, it's, it, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It is a grind. And so I came in with that messaging mm -hmm. and I was like, look, this is going to suck. I promise you this will suck. That's what I can guarantee you. Mm -hmm. But if you push through, there's a really cool experience on the other side of it. And so I think that like refreshingly raw and honest messaging really struck a, a chord, especially in an industry where people just don't share that reality. Correct. I think there's a huge gap and like your marketing stands out to me because yeah, it is very transparent and authentic, right? When everyone's saying, get a million appointments in the next 90 yeah. days or I'll give you a thousand dollars wasting your time. Like when someone comes in with a completely different approach, it's like, you know, observe the masses and do the opposite, which yep. I 100% agree. But just to wind it back a sec, how did you get so good at getting the traffic? Like what made you good compared to everyone else? And like what methods were I tr they? I tried everything really quickly. Right. Like I... And I pumped money into like paying people to teach me any, any opportunity that came up. It's such a simple concept. It's like, I just got this link. All I have to do is get eyeballs to it. Mm -hmm. It's fundamentally simple. It's just not easy. Mm -hmm. um, and so over the space of 18 months, I tried every possible 
angle. I tried the organic thing on Facebook. I tried blogging. I paid, I did Google ads. I did Facebook ads. I did the the email list solo ads. Like I just did everything to find a way to get eyeballs and kind of eventually figured out what worked and what didn't work and went from there. Nice, man. Nice. Yeah. What What was, was there one thing that was like the most successful out of everything? Because I know, let me disclose this, but like, you know, you had a, you had a pretty big day. I remember yeah. one day. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the, I guess the Facebook in a couple of different ways and Google ads were like the two big ones. Mm -hmm. Google ads one was a, was a little bit trickier um, for a couple of reasons. So Facebook, Facebook was one that was more like replicatable. Mm -hmm. um, both for me and for, and for other people. Um, and the day you're referring to was a launch with, with Tony Robbins and, and Russell Brunson. And they did a, they released a product in 2019 called the knowledge business blueprint. Mm -hmm. And that was a combination of done organically and with paid ads. And I did 120 grand in commissions in a day. Wow. Uh, US. Was that life changing at the time? Like, it, it's funny looking back. Like, yeah, it was, I mean, obviously the, the career I was in before I made good money. Yeah. Like in the States I was making like 200 and something a year, mm -hmm. but I had no life. Were you getting tax on that? Oh, hundred percent. Okay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, yeah, the, whatever the, I think my US tax rate, 30, 35% or whatever. Yeah. Um, not as bad as here, yeah. but, uh, yeah, normal, you know, normal salary taxes. Um, but, uh, so, so I wasn't, it wasn't like I was, you know, one of these stories you hear online about I was making 20 grand and then all of a sudden I was making millions. Like I was earning a good salary. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't have that like rags to riches story mm -hmm. um, that a lot of people do online. But yeah, I mean, anybody seeing that kind of money come in in one hit, like you very rarely get paid 100 grand in a day. Mm -hmm. That's There's very few people that come. And it was crazy because what happened was they did the launch. The, it was a like a, a live webinar type situation. And the affiliates were just pumping traffic to register for this event. Mm. And so I got 10, 15, 20,000 registrants over the space of like a month in the lead up to it. We can dive into that further if you want to, but I basically pumped a ton of money into ads with no return mm. for like a month because it wasn't, wasn't until this live event thing kicked off. They did, the, they did the presentation. What could go wrong went wrong. Like the price reveal popped up way too early and there were tech issues and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and here's me with like, I think I had like 30 grand in ads sunk into it. Oh my God. Like I went hard. Wow. Um, and uh, fully out of my control. Probably a bit stupid in hindsight, but you know, I was like, it's not like I've got a bit of money. So if I lose 30 grand, I lose 30 grand. Mm -hmm. um, it would have hurt, but it wouldn't have broken me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was one of those situations. And uh, what happened though, they, they, kind of made the product live and the cart broke. Oh my God. And they had, they said they had like every backup, every backup, every backup. And it kind of just ended. And then me and like this other guy that I'd been kind of talking to throughout the whole launch, we were like, so, so what happened? We're like refreshing the affiliate dashboard. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. We didn't hear anything. Didn't hear anything. Eventually Dean Graziosi went live in the affiliate group and he's like, don't stress. It's done amazing. We just broke Infusionsoft and uh, it took a couple of days, but then it was like three, four o'clock in the morning and this dude calls me, he was in the UK and he's like, dude, refresh your account. And so I'm like, groggy. I, I actually flipped my sleeping pattern for that month because it was on obviously a US time zone. So I was working at night and then just sleeping during the day. And then uh, I'm like refreshing it and it's like 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand, 60. And it was like, you know, it was like winning the lotto. Was it more than you thought you would have done? Yeah. What you, did you have like a ballpark that you were kind of estimating? Well, after the live, I just wanted to break even. Right. <laughs> I was like, I just want my money You're back. Like, Fuck, I'm just sunk there. <laughs> yeah, again. I know. Um, I mean, I was hoping maybe I could double my money. Mm -hmm. Was was like, I would have been like stoked with that. But yeah, it just, it went ballistic. It's crazy, man. That's, yeah. um, that's a hell of a day. And yeah, like you said, not many people would get to experience making $100,000 in a day. And yeah. even though that wasn't life changing, I feel like if that was me, it just wouldn't have been a huge paradigm shift. It's like, it oh was. my God, yeah. this is possible. And I think- you know, back to the first dollar thing. I remember, I'll never forget my first sale that I ever made uh, in business because it's a moment where it actually just validates everything. Because mm -hmm. until then, you're like, oh, this isn't real. You can't actually do it. You hear all these people doing it. Then you do it, you're like, holy shit, it's actually possible, which is, um, it's, it's crazy. Funny. But now you're obviously doing something very different, which yeah. I'm really fascinated by. It's kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, the one sort of person business model, mm -hmm. right? Tell us a little bit about that. No sales calls, like yeah. how does it all work? Yeah, so the affiliate thing ultimately led to what I'm doing now in terms of I created the affiliate offer to, to help people with their or get started in that space um, and did that exclusively for like 18 months. We ran that program and it, it kind of quickly shot past the million dollar mark and did really, really well. Um, and that was like my gateway drug into 
holy shit, you can take like what's between your ears. And if you know how to package it up, you know, Russell has kind of coined the term, you're one funnel away. Mm-hmm. It's like you're one offer away. Mm-hmm. In business, you are one good offer away from like everything changing, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and that was such an epiphany for me. It was like, holy crap, we can just take some knowledge or experience or expertise or whatever and there's so many like crazy nuanced and niche cases of it Mm. i was like this is really really cool and so went deep down that rabbit hole the last couple of years and experimented with a lot of different stuff around selling and packaging information and where i really landed was helping helping folks who have some form of expertise but i think the the big problem in the coaching consulting world is if you're anything like me you didn't start this business to be chained to your desk all day. Mm-hmm. Like I, I used to do that. I would have just kept doing what I was doing. And so through some mentorship and through a lot of experimenting, we've kind of developed this model where a lot of people think in that game, if your offer's over like two grand, if you've got a coaching program that's 5K, 10K, that you have to get on the phone to sell it. And it's just fundamentally not true. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like this big myth. It's this big secret that people think it's crazy when I tell them. We've mm-hmm. done up to 50 grand in one transaction without a call just through the dms um and we can dive into kind of how that works but yeah that's what we that's what we help people do now is like if you've got a 3k 5k 10k 20k type offer and you like the idea of being able to get clients without needing to spend 45 minutes an hour on one strategy call two strategy calls and and kind of look at that christmas tree calendar is what i call it you know (laughs) uh then then that's what we do now and it's been it's been a ride to kind of build it but it's been a lot of fun yeah, definitely, man. I think it's it's always cool to see like innovations on certain ways because yeah, like everyone has that belief that you need a sales call to close a deal and all that stuff. But mm. what I think is the key to it and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's all the content that you put out, right? It's your brand because yeah. you build so much trust with people. You literally yeah. give them all the information they could ever need. You show them your clients. You sh- you're so transparent that mm-hmm. it's like, you know, like I would go and sign up to a complete stranger if I'd seen all that content. Right. Yep. Is that is that kind of the foundation of the whole thing? Yeah, that's that's it exactly. So the way I kind of explain it to people is um, in that type of business, in any type of business really, but particularly a coaching business, you've got three parts. You've got the marketing slash like audience slash traffic. You've got your sales process and you've got your offer, right? And the typical way of selling coaching online these days is it's very sales process heavy. So mm-hmm. it's like a little bit of content, slap together an offer and pound the DMs and fill up your calendar. So that's mm-hmm. the sales process, right? Mm-hmm. And it's fine and it works, but it's funny because people use the word leverage and they talk about leverage and yet all the attention and energy is going on the one part of the process that lacks leverage, mm-hmm. which is you're, the only way you can get leverage is by hiring more people. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't really have interest in hiring a ton of people and kind of doing it that way. And so effectively, as you've said, is what we've done is we've repurposed, I guess, the energy or the focus from the sales process to the offer And in a big way, the marketing on the front end. So it's really about where you focus your time and energy on the what you sell and the and the who you sell it to and the communicating with them through the content and less on pounding the DMs and the calls all day one by one. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Because every time, yeah, that's that's what I think is it's not fundamentally wrong with businesses, but last week I actually went to this business group, it's called the Caraggio, right? And anyway, they were kind of explaining a bit about their business and like, yeah, like we want every single person that ever comes into our ecosystem to get their business to $5 million a year because at $5 million a year, you can take home, you know, around 500 grand after tax, which is like, it's probably really true because most traditional businesses have yeah. maybe like a 20% margin at the end of the day. But mm-hmm. like with a business like yours, like obviously you have like ad spend and content costs, but like it's a relatively lean model, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Super I mean, lean. even with my business, it's like, you know, my sales guys calendar is full. It's like, okay, well, fuck going to take on an extra, you know, five to 10 grand a month in expenses to yep. bring on someone else. And it always just brings on new challenges, which I'm not opposed to, but I think I'm very similar to you, I think, in terms of like the drive for being, you know, a business owner, like having that freedom to, you know, go and, you know, for you, like chill out with your kid, mm-hmm. you know, for me, maybe go golf, go chill out with the friends, you know what I mean? And yeah, I think you got to kind of get really clear on what you want and then reverse engineer the business for that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's pros and cons to everything, right? Like, we started running some YouTube ads the other day and I kind of put this messaging out there and it's funny because it's it's so different to every other ad in the space and it takes 10 minutes before the you know the trolls and stuff come out in the comments mm. and someone's like yeah but you're going to lose so many conversions and I'm like sure mm. I'll happily lose those conversions mm. because if they need an hour of my time or they need an hour on the phone to somebody that I'm paying they're just not there yet as mm. far as I'm concerned and that's fine like I don't need the money right now 
right? I don't need the money now. I'm, this business has served me well. We can wait. So go watch another YouTube video. Go follow my Instagram stories for another three weeks. Mm -hmm. Just do what you got to do until you don't need that hour. Mm -hmm. And then come to us and we'll send you a link and let's do it. Yeah, it's like rather than shorten the sales cycle, it's lengthening it, but it just yeah. that's going to increase your conversions hugely. Yeah, and the other thing is everyone talks about like, you know, attract dream clients and blah, 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 blah. And what nobody talks about is how dream clients for me starts when you sell and how you sell. Mm. Everyone thinks delivery is in isolation and sales is in isolation. Uh, amazing delivery and really liking who you work with, I think starts with how you sell. Because if you sell to people prematurely, your delivery is fucked. Mm. Because they're just not ready. The mm. stress is through the roof mm. when you start. And it's like, you know, you, if you, there's all these guys that are salespeople kind of promising the world and they're just getting people in who aren't there yet be that emotionally, be that financially, like whatever. Mm. Uh, and then any wonder delivery's hard. Mm. Whereas when my guys come to me, they're a thousand percent ready to go. In a lot of cases, I've pushed them away at least once and said, come back later or go watch this first, right? Instead of like trying to hammer them into a call. Mm. And so when they do arrive, it's very calm. Mm. And it's like, well, let's just cool, take I'm our ready. time and build something properly. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. Do you ever like just jump on a conversation with someone if they want to have like a five minute chat or is it not even like, it's very strict, like not even. Yeah. I, look, not often. Mm. Um, but we do with some of our clients, if they're crafting a new offer, mm. uh, I'll encourage them to jump on a 10, 15 minute chat if they can, mm. because you want to hear the questions that people are asking. Um, so the way we do it is we, we kind of build the offer into a, into a document that's, six to 10 pages that they can send out and that's got everything in it. It's got the, the goals, the deliverables, the investment, the risk reversal guarantee, if there's a guarantee, all that kind of jazz. Um, and so we'll still get them to send that out. But then with the first few people, we'll get them to jump on calls for 10, 15 minutes to see what questions they're asking, having read that offer and what objections they're putting up. Mm -hmm. Because when we hear those, then we can feed the answers to those questions back into the content and we can also tighten up the offer to address them before mm. they come up. Mm. So initially, yes, ideally we get it to the point where the document kind of does it for us. And this document is just like pretty much everything you'd need to, to sell. And it's, it's, nothing, it's what it's you nothing do on fancy. a strategy session. It's yeah. just condensed down into a document. And this is the crazy part to me. I'm like, well, why, why explain everything one by one when you can kind of just like write it down mm. and they can read it. And if they can't make a decision off the back of that, they can send some questions over text. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, if they can't make a decision off the back of that, then let's just not do it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Do you think like in terms of that business, like what do you think is like the biggest limitation that, you know, because for me, I always think my ideal business doesn't require my time mm -hmm. at all, right? But obviously for that, you need staff. So like for your business, what's the sort of limitations in terms of like how many people you could take on or how big you could grow? Or do you just have aspirations just to keep it at like a, certain level yeah i think i mean look this is the current structure of it is is me consulting so mm -hmm. there's natural kind of limitations in terms of you know i'm the face of it and therefore mm -hmm. i'm kind of part of the product you could outsource i do the, uh, the quote-unquote selling at the moment the very arduous activity of sending a link that could easily be outsourced uh for a commission which we'll probably do at some point i could bring on like a client success manager if mm -hmm. you will but i think one of the problems with a lot of the coaching industry is they pack out their calendar with calls and they got no time to actually deliver on the shit that they've sold, mm. right? And so then they have to go and hire a delivery team and then their costs go up, which means that they need to take on more clients, which means they need more calls, which means they get busier, which means that, you know, it's like this kind of negative spiral. And so because I've got the time to work with them, there's a lot more capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, this type of business, like I don't really have designs on it being bigger than one to two million a year. Mm -hmm. Um could it be? Probably. Uh, but then I think it, it kind of changes complexion. Mm. As I think about it like, so I was saying I used to work in corporate and I worked in consulting and you've got two different types of like consulting or advisory businesses. You've got like your big four shops, like your Deloitte, your EY, your KPMG who employ, you know, tens of thousands of people. And then you've got like your little family offices. Mm. And I always worked for more the boutique consulting firms and there was like 30 to 50 staff and they were really, really good at specific things and they had really strong relationships with their clients that fed them work mm -hmm. and you know people would bring their family in on a friday afternoon and there was always like you know sit around and watch the rugby and like have drinks and whatever it was just a really good vibe and so i think about my online 
business more like those practices. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think if you want to quote unquote scale kind of like infinitely, you're looking at more of like the, you know, the big box type yeah. structure. It's funny, man, because literally I was sitting in this seat a couple of weeks ago. I, I said this thing and I actually got a lot of people giving me hate comments for this on um, YouTube, but I said something like, I'd rather have like a small team of killers, like, you know, six Navy SEALs than like a hundred frontline soldiers, right? And it's kind of similar, right? Like all these people at Deloitte, EY, like they're graduates from uni, they don't really know that much versus like the boutique thing that you could, you know, have really, really good people, build closer relationships with these clients and, you know, keep them for a long time. I think... Yeah, I really like that approach. I, yeah. I definitely agree. Sure. And it flows through to the client relationships. Like I've got clients that have been with me for three years in the online coach. That's unheard of, mm. right? I'm flying out to New York next week. I'm meeting up with a bunch of them. And like, like three years in this industry is like an eternity. Yeah, that's crazy. It just doesn't happen. But that's because of how it's structured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Because I think back to what you said, like all these people who scale these coaching offers to like a million dollars plus a month. Yeah. Like, I mean, I feel like when you get to a certain point in that space, there's always going to be some kind of like negativity, like, you know, the Reddit yep. threads and stuff like yep. that. But there is a lot of sentiment because they promise so much on the front end, which is really quite unrealistic for most people. And then on the back end, it's like, you know, NDAs and all this shit so that people don't yeah. speak out about it, which is, it's kind of sad to me because I think, you know, people do have, you know, the ability to do these things, but when they're told that it's really easy that, you know, you can make all the money you want in the next 90 days, it's just bullshit, yeah. right? Like it's really not true. To build something, you have to actually take time, effort and energy. And so, yeah, I think the problem with those bigger coaching offers is like you said, like they have all this time for, sorry, all this energy in the sales and marketing yeah but like a lack in the, in the fulfillment. Yeah. And I think what naturally has to happen when you're dealing with those types of numbers and that much volume is that it has to be a somewhat cookie cutter solution, which I think creates problems in itself because you can't put a thousand people through individual bespoke paths, right? It's, just, mm. it's impossible. Yeah. Whereas when you keep the volume a little bit lower, I do the kickoff call with everybody mm. right now. Um, and so I have, I can channel all my experience into going, well, I think this is the path that we need to take. And so you should pay attention to sections one, three, and six, mm. right? And we can tailor it, wait on this, start on this, don't do that at all, as opposed to every person going through the exact same path, because every individual is different and every business is different. Correct. Yeah. hundred percent. Random question. Have you ever calculated your cost of ideal lifestyle? I feel like Leona and I might've gone through that exercise once, but what the number came to, I couldn't tell you. It just reminded me of that because you know, when, when you think of getting rich, people think you need to have hundreds of millions of dollars to get all this crazy stuff. But like yeah. when you actually break down how much things cost and like, if you broke it down on a monthly basis, you could literally live an insane life for like 150, 200 grand spent in a year. Yep. Right. You want to get to like, you know, multiple supercars and stuff. You could do for like, you know, half a mil to a million a year. And so I think, you know, calculating that cost of ideal lifestyle, I was just wondering if you'd factored that into like building this business. Cause it's like, you know, you make really good money, but you don't yeah. need to have this ridiculous amount to sustain a lifestyle. Yeah. I think the reason I've kind of landed on this business, another reason I've landed on this business model too, is um, I've got kind of aspirations to do things offline as well. And so I don't necessarily want to build this gigantic thing online that would mean I don't have any capacity to mm. do that. The good thing is the margins, as you said. Mm. So this can kind of be the cash cow to fuel investments, to fuel other projects. Mm. But you're totally right. Like, you know, we both live near the beach, mm -hmm. right? You can buy a car, pay cash. Mm -hmm. The stress is very low. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very, very low. Mm. Um, it's a good, uh, it's a good existence without it being crazy. Mm hundred -hmm. yeah. percent. I think it's, yeah. Every time, I think the Gold Coast is probably like the best place to live, just whether you're an entrepreneur or whatever, because it's hard to be in a bad mood here, really. Like yeah. in a bad mood, you just go out to the beach. I know it's fucking raining today, but yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's such an amazing place just to yeah build and create from, I feel. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I lived in, I mean, I lived in the States. I lived in New York. Um, that was a lot of fun. And then I came back, was in Brisbane for a bit. But yeah, the Gold Coast is, it's, I, I, I can't see myself leaving. Yeah. I lived in Kansas for two years and- no disrespect to any of my Kansas friends if you see this, but I see videos and stories from there now. I'm like, oh my God, like I could not comprehend living there. It was really fun at the time because I was in college, like, you know, having a lot of fun, but like, like living there, like as an adult and like living life there, like I just, I can't imagine, I think they're really sheltered from the rest of the world there. So they think, oh, it's actually, you know, really nice here. But when you, if they came to a place like this, like this is literally fucking heaven on earth. Like it is completely We're very different. lucky on the Gold Coast. Very lucky. I, I did six months in Kansas as well. I think you told me that, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely a different world. But well, what's the sort of projects that you're looking at like offline eventually? Um, I want to, uh, I, I, I like my wine. 
like mm. my nice wine. So definitely something in that industry. Although every person, I, I've got like no hospitality experience. Mm. So very naive. I worked yeah. in a cafe for seven years. So I can give you some pointers. There we go. Carrying glass. We're, we're halfway there. Um, everyone I talk to is like, if you want to make money, don't go into wine. Mm. Um, so I don't know, maybe like a little wine bar. I think oh, there's yeah, nice. opportunity for that on the coast. Whether that evolves into, you know, trying to get involved in the supply chain further down the line in some way, maybe. Mm. One of my, like, I've said this since I was a kid. One, like, I'm a mad Bulldogs fan, AFL. And one of my, like, big, big, big goals has always been to be on the board. Oh, nice. Or, if possible, president. Um, I'm, like, a fifth, fourth, fifth generation supporter. Right. And, like, I was the kid that, like, you know, cried when they lost, like just obsessed, mm. obsessed. Um, and so uh, that's like the long, long-term goal. I love it, man. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I think, uh, was it 2018 you guys won the first one? 16. 2016. Yeah. It was before Richmond won in 2017. That's correct. Yeah, shit. That was a crazy time, man. Because I think for both of us, we hadn't had a, a flag in a long time. Yep. I yep. remember yep. going down to, I can't remember the street in Richmond. It's like the main road where the bars are. And like, mm. mate, that place was mayhem. Like it, yeah, even though I like, I, I don't like to live viscerally through that stuff. I like, you know, I don't need football and stuff to make me happy, but man, it's crazy when your team wins. Yeah. It's just euphoric. Yeah, I can't it, imagine yeah. being in the team. Oh, dude, it'd be out of control. Yeah, I um, I was living in the States at the time and um, it's so funny because my sister was getting married and it was early that year, early 2016. And she's like, oh, I'm getting married on the 1st of October. It's a Saturday. And I'm like, no, you're not. Oh, she's shit. like, why? And I was like, because the grand final's on. She's like, mate, it's been... They, the last one they won was 1954. And she's like, there, there's no chance. I'm like, you watch Murphy's Law. If you book your wedding on that day, that will be in the grand final. And so she I did. made her move it. I made her move it to the Friday. And lo and behold, so Thank we got God. home at like 4 a.m. from the wedding, mum and I, and uh, flew down at like 7 o'clock the next morning. So hungover. To Melbourne? To Melbourne. Oh, did you get tickets to the gym? Yeah, oh, yeah, my yeah. God. That would have been um, I just got back from the States for a couple of weeks for my sister's wedding. And uh, yeah, on like three hours sleep, went to the game and it was, it was kind of a blur, but it was unbelievable. That would have been incredible. Yeah. I actually have a selfish question just to go backtrack a second. Mm. Like how could you implement something like your sales process into like an agency business model, for example, that's not so consulting focused? We haven't worked with a lot of agencies. I mean, I've worked with some agencies that want to bolt on consulting mm. as like an additional income stream. But it's not something I've put a lot of thought into because I try not to split my I guess, focus between different buckets. But if I think about like, you know, I've engaged you to do stuff for me. Think about that dynamic. Like we had a call, but could have very easily just spoke on Instagram, right? Mm. Like I could have very easily pinged you a DM. I think I did ping you a DM. I pinged someone a DM. I got in touch somehow. Email. Yeah, email. Yeah, I got yeah. in touch because you, you emailed one of my mates and then he mentioned it. I think when you sent the email, we were like having a beer and he's like, oh, look at this because we we're talking about podcasting. So the natural reaction to me sending that email is, all right, well, let's get on the phone, mm. right? But you're your sales guy could easily just go, well, let's just have a quick chat on mm. the DMs. If you're doing the real high-end stuff and it's like about tailoring packages and all that mm. kind of stuff, maybe it's worth doing it there. But if it's a, you know, if it's a cookie cutter, like 3K bundle of podcast bookings and this many articles and whatever, mm. they could very easily do that over chat and go, so Bob, tell me what you're trying to accomplish, mm. right? Well, I want to get more reach. I want to drive this traffic here. We've got this product. Sweet. What's your budget? i uh, probably looking at, you know, two to 5K, leave it with me fire them over this is what we'd recommend and just and then that's it like it yeah. wouldn't need to be more complicated than that i have considered doing like similar sort of ads where you just sort of run it to the to a profile ad and just say like hey if you're interested in this kind of thing just send us a dm yeah because i think it could definitely could be closed over dm yep. especially lower ticket stuff yeah. yeah it's definitely worth considering i think i think in the in the agency space like like for example one of the reasons that i wanted to i guess connect with you guys was because of the local factor mm. right and so i think if you were to try and deploy it more globally, you'd, you'd really need a, a kind of a point of difference in terms of the attraction. Mm. Um, like, you know, really strong case studies, really strong word of mouth, um, a slightly different process. Mm. Like I remember, I remember I got, and I don't know if you guys do this or not, but I remember I got an email from someone that said, um, like the big objection with taking on an agency to help you with um, content, not necessarily getting booked on podcasts, but like, it's the it's the time input to create videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. Let's take a YouTube agency. Mm -hmm. um, I've still got to sit down and create all the videos and that's yeah. typically people's objects. Like, oh, I just don't have the time for it. And so their offer was like, we'll interview you, right? right? We'll interview you. We'll bring the questions. You just show up. 
where, and just answer the questions and then everything else will be done for you. And so they've addressed the big objection in the offer. Mm. And so I think, you know, something unique that's a little bit different would go a long way, you know, in industry if you're kind of otherwise doing the same thing. Um, but, you know, having a personal brand that sits in front of the agency mm-hmm. where people can really resonate with the person, that would help really well. Maybe a combination of those factors would make it a lot easier. Mm. Yeah, nice, man. Nice. Yeah, I definitely think more content, more nurture and yeah, definitely innovating on the current processes because yeah, I mean, it's good. Like, don't get me wrong, but I think it's always cool to have different strategies you can, you know, work in there. Yeah. Man, to kind of like, I guess, wrap things up, like, what would you say in terms of like everything that you've done? Like if you could go back in time and like give yourself some advice, whether you were, you know, let's say like maybe 15 years old, like what, what would you tell yourself? That's a really good question. I think my, see, it's, it's so hard because like, I don't like to say I'd change things. Um, my, my mentality, which ultimately, as I said, ran me into the ground and made me sick, but it also got me to where I am was that I can just outwork everyone back then. Like that was my, my jam was outwork everybody. Mm. Um, and so it, it probably wouldn't, it wouldn't be anything around don't work as hard, but probably like slow down and enjoy it a bit more. Mm. Um, I worked a lot of my twenties mm. and I don't regret that because it got me to where I am now, but you're only 20 ones, mm. right? And it's a really cool part of your life. That would probably be one thing in, in terms of like, what would I, I don't even know if I'd change it, but it's like a tackle it with this perspective. I think when I look at the business, maybe not going back to to being 15 years old, but if there was a way that I could have started a personal brand earlier, mm. like I couldn't do it with the corporate thing. Yeah, even just start creating content. Something, like. yeah. Like, just, like I did a lot of other, I, like I, I actually started online in like 2011. I bought a website and was like dabbling. And if I'd had the ability to start a personal brand sooner, so anyone watching that's on the fence and hasn't, like if you do it and you do it well, it is a license to print cash. Mm-hmm. Do you know, uh, have you heard of Good Good, the golf? Uh, there's like golf YouTubers started by this guy, Garrett. So he was like the OG golf content creator. Like he'd been creating these trick shots for like 10, 15 years. Yeah. And like I, their business now would be doing at minimum million dollars a month. Like I would say it'd be like, you know, probably 30 plus million dollars a year business with all the things they've got on. But yeah, it just started from him doing trick shots, documenting that. But he was just like early to it. And, you know, even though it might not seem early, I think it is still, you know, it's going to be around forever, right? Yeah. Like, these things are so fucking addictive. It's like yeah. unbelievable. You think people are going to just stop scrolling and watching content? Like, yeah. no, I think it's, yeah. yeah. I think the trap people fall into though is they go, all right, well, if, you know, nothing's going to happen until I've got 200,000 followers. Mm. And that's just not the case either. Like my audience is tiny. It's like 20,000 mm. people mm. across all platforms. That's mm. not even like on Insta. I've got like 1,800 followers on Instagram. Mm. Um, and we've turned that 20,000 into like millions and millions and millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. And so you don't have to just build a personal brand to become famous. Mm. If you can pair branding and I mean, this is controversial now with, you know, the Alex Hormozzi advice of like, just give, 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 give. And yeah, I don't know. That's a co- topic for another day, but you can have a small personal brand and monetize the hell out of it at the same time. hundred percent. Like, I don't know the exact book, but it's called something like, uh, something through like a thousand the concept is like true fans. Yeah, thousand yeah. true fans. Yeah, yeah. Like you'd rather have a thousand true fans. Yeah. Well, again, it's all subjective. Some people would rather have a hundred thousand people that don't really care about them because they're just after the clout, right? Mm. But some people, I would generally rather have a thousand people that were all, you know, wanting to pay me and have a hundred thousand people that would just be like, oh yeah, I like his video. Yeah. Right. Like it's you'd rather build that deeper connection. So I think, yeah, people get infatuated with the, with the idea of having more and more, mm. but it's definitely the quality. And back to what you said before about you know, slowing down, like it's really hard to internalize as an entrepreneur, slow down to speed up, Yeah. right? I, I did a lot of self-reflection when I was in Europe and I was like, I just observed myself on a day-to-day basis. I'm like laying on the beach in um, Portugal. I'm like, what do I do on a day-to-day? And I, I literally wake up, go straight to the coffee machine, go straight to my desk, yep. right? Nothing in between, like no time. I got into the point where I wasn't even planning things out anymore. I was just yeah. like, grind, grind, grind. I'm like, why the hell did you stop like actually planning? And so- mm. I think you can't see the full picture when you're inside the frame. So you really need to step out sometimes and be like, okay, cool. I should stop doing this. I should start doing this. I should spend, you know, rather than try and cram 10 things into a day thinking I'm being productive, just literally spend six hours on one thing. Yeah. Which, you know, it's always just a learning game, but I think it's, um, yeah, it's definitely powerful when you take that time to, yeah. to reflect and sit back. The biggest like quote unquote kind of like goal setting or, um, trick or hack or whatever for me and i didn't realize this until after the event is like going back to even high school i did this and i just didn't realize it at the time and i've since repeated it many 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 times is i think a lot of the reason people like don't hit goals or targets or whatever um is 
is they don't have enough trust in themselves to hit it when they when they start it, and so they kind of half ass it mm. along the way. And for me, the thing that's constantly worked is one clear, tangible goal at a time. So like when I was an affiliate, it was like I picked an award that I wanted to win, mm-hmm. right? And some people would be like, you know, it's materialistic or, or whatever. It worked for me. Picked it like a tangible thing, and I just don't stop until I accomplish that thing. Mm-hmm. And when you do that enough times you start to develop such self-trust that when you pick something, it's inevitable. Mm. It's like, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Mm -hmm. And then to tie this into what you were just saying is when you know it's inevitable, that's when you, I think you can slow down Mm -hmm. because you know you're going to get that thing that you want and then you can like build properly towards it Mm -hmm. as opposed to this like highly anxious, I don't know if it'll happen type existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense, man. You want to have that... That clarity and it's definitely hard when you don't have any runs on the board, but yeah. when you can start to build that momentum, like I think at the start, man, you just have to go as hard as humanly possible. Then mm. you get to a certain point where you do have some, you know, leverage where you can, you know, create that time to step back. But yeah, man, thank you so much for sharing all the insights. It was that was really fun. Enjoyable. It was good. Where can where can people find you? Uh Jacobcarris.com. Links off to everything. Or you can Perfect. go look on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, all the same name. So amazing. Thanks for joining me. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you.